New Zealand and welcome to another episode of Turn the Page. My name is Mark Pacey from the Wired Up Archive and today I'm continuing to read Don Farmer's book, Walking Back to Happiness. Today we are starting at Chapter 2. We did the other ones, well not last week, but the week before. Somebody forgot that it was a holiday on Monday. So starting off, Chapter 2, The Town Awakens. It was only a short drive to town from his orchard in Kurutafiti Street, but old Walter Tate had never been able to relax and enjoy it. He loved his little black Austin, but he always felt nervous behind the wheel, and this Friday morning was no different. As he approached the intersection with West Street, Walter reminded himself out loud, you can't be too careful. The car was moving at a snail's pace, and it was highly unlikely that there would be any cross traffic to worry him, but that didn't calm Walter's nerves. He took a foot further off the accelerator, almost coming to a stop before chugging across the intersection, the car pleading with Walter to change down a gear or two. And remember, to put your foot back on the clutch when you do so, Walter. Walter had been born in the days of the horse and buggy, and although not afraid to try his hand at most things, he never adapted to the high-tech world of cars and combustion engines. He knew how to check the oil, top up with water and the radiator, and make sure the tyres weren't going flat. Other than that, he didn't even pretend to understand the mysteries that lurked under the bonnet. On the rare occasion the car refused to cooperate and wouldn't start, Walter immediately turned to those who could magically put things right. He would summon a mechanic from either Athel Road's garage or Fred Nichols' garage, and if they didn't and if they couldn't drop everything and be there, he would turn up to Tui Morgan or Barney Rhodes. Outside of motor cars, Walter would have a crack at anything. Even on the short drive into town this Friday, Walter's mind was racing. He was running the biggest privately owned apple orchard in New Zealand. But that was not all. There were problems facing the town that Walter, a long-term and experienced borough councillor, had to help solve. But right now, his task was to pick up supplies for home and his Kuratafati Street orchard. Having cleared the intersection, Walter peered through his rimless glasses, feeling even more nervous as he approached Main Street. Several times in the past he had stalled the car here as he attempted to turn right, but today he was determined not to do so, and although he, although he again buttoned right off to a crawl. <clears throat> On Main Street he pulled up outside the Methodist Church, left the car unlocked, and with his trademark jaunty step, crossed over to the Widered Upper Farmers Cooperative Association, WFCA, the largest retail shop in town. As he walked, he fumbled about his coat pocket for his shopping list. It wasn't much of a list, but with the weekend coming up, shops would be closed and some of what he was after couldn't wait until Monday. Especially leaf tea. That was needed on Monday morning for the orchard worker's smoko. Walter half hoped he would be able to buy a balsa wood box of broken orange pekoi, the nicest tea on sale, but it was hard to get. He opened the door and walked into the store. Several staff looked up and smiled. Walter was well known to them. They had a soft spot for Walter, who could be heard if not seen by, every, by everyone any time he came in. His high-pitched voice gave him away, when in full cry it caused his goatee beard to bob up and down. When Walter was in the store, staff made a mental note to watch their P's and Q's. Walter was deeply religious. He didn't appreciate loud and aggressive people, and certainly would not brook any blasphemy. Store manager Guy Brunton was out on the floor, talking to his wife Betty and the other office staff, when he saw Walter come in. G'day, Walter, he called out, and waved. Walter waved back, then moved off to his left to the grocery section. There he was spoilt for choice. Keith Whiteman, Ivan Gray, Jim Farley, George Bozade, and Graham, grimy, Williams were all rostered on. Even though it was early, they had been busy. Much of the food they sold came in bulk, and that meant work. 
Whole cheeses from the cheese factory at the south end of town had to be cut into wedges. Flour came in huge sacks, as did sultanas, dates, sugar and rice. They all had to be broken down and weighed in portions. A bacon slicer dealt to the sides of bacon and to ham and luncheon sausage. Having picked up the few items that he had listed, Walter left the store and returned to his car, putting what he had bought on the back seat. He had not needed anything from the hardware section this time, nor the menswear, and certainly not from the women's clothing section with its elite showroom. <clears throat> Walter decided that he didn't need to call at the rival grocery in the centre of town, WH Day Limited, as he often did, but that he would pop into the third grocery store in town, run by Cathy Everett. Her store on the corner of Main Street and Wood Street nearly opposite the big gum tree, Greyhound's most famous landmark. It had been stolen along with several other saplings from Samuel Oates's wheelbarrow way back when the town was an infant and planted there. Mrs Everett was widowed, her husband Wally having died in World War II. She was a genteel woman, much loved by everyone in town. Her weatherboard shop, with its high ceilings and plenty of floor space, was a favourite haunt for children. The main attraction being the wide selection of lollies kept in large glass jars on the counter. The counter was big, a heavy wooden one that seemed to stretch for miles. <clears throat> on it, Mrs Everett had spaced at regular intervals a dozen or more of the glass jars stocked with a conversation lollies, hard tubes, Victory V's, Black Balls, Raspberry Jobs, Jersey Caramels, Minties, Milkshake Lollies and more. They were all guaranteed to satisfy your sugar cravings and rot your teeth. And Walter quite liked to indulge in a few from time to time. The shopping done only on one stop. Whoops, do it again. The shopping done only one stop. Nope, I read that wrong again. The emphasis is wrong. The shopping done, only one stop remained. Walter drove back the way he had come and stopped opposite Horton's butchery. He wasn't after meat. This was strictly business. For years Walter had been mayor, Mick Morton's right... Oh, Monday. For years Walter had been mayor, Mick Horton's right-hand man on the borough council and, with a meeting scheduled for the next week, he wanted to get a heads up from Mick as to what was going to be the hot topic for debate. As Walter drove to the butchery, bachelor Fred Harris came round the Wood Street corner, heading into town to have his hair cut. Fred was a shy man of few words, and these were spoken so softly as to be almost inaudible. You had to know Fred to have a bolter's chance of understanding what he was saying. Wearing his heavy tweed coat, Fred walked with an ambling gait, his head bent downwards, his hefty frame causing his shoulders to slump. He passed hairdresser Ted Alexander, standing on the footpath outside his barber's shop. Good morning, Fred. The greeting met with a grunting acknowledgement, but Fred walked on. Three minutes later, he walked in to the rival barbers, to again be greeted with, Good morning, Fred, by hairdresser Noel Bassett. Once again, Fred grunted in reply, this time adding a shy grin. He sat down on the long sofa, awaiting his turn in the barber's chair. Noel had just finished giving a young boy the customary short back and sides, and was brushing hair from the boy's shoulders. He whipped away the gown that had been wrapped around the boy's neck, and as a coup de grace, sprayed a fine mist of sweet-smelling bay rum over his head. Noel gave Fred a nod, and ambling to the chair, Fred sat quietly, but was coerced into a smile or two by the, by the barber's banter. Once his hair was cut, and he too had been sprayed with bay rum, Fred murmured, Thank you and paid up before setting off the way he had come, back to the wee blue painted cottage that he shared with his mother in Wood Street. Reaching the corner with only a few yards to go, Fred had a change of heart, and crossed over to Everett's store. He had decided to treat himself. Mrs Everett knew Fred well. She knew better than to embarrass him with too much conversation, but gave him a kindly smile. 
Fred mumbled out what he fancied, and she obliged, filling a white paper bag with humbugs, black bulls and mushroom lollies, and then popped in two banana-flavoured Eskimos and four wrapped sweets known as chocolate eclairs. He stuffed the bag in his coat pocket, gave Mrs Everett the exact money, one shilling, and left the store. Mid-morning was approaching, and Greytown's sleepy streets were now almost fully awake. Walter and Rosie Batty were setting up for the day with their drapery and general outfitter's shop. As Walter arranged racks of men's trousers and shirts on the shop floor, Rosie tidied up at the counter. On it she had a stamp pad and two or three rubber stamps. They were all of animals, an elephant, a lion and a giraffe. Rosie loved seeing young children come into the shop with their mothers, and when, and when they did, she would stamp the backs of their hand with one or other of the stamps. The children loved it, and the mothers loved it too. It was a simple way of cementing friendships with the families the business relied on. Next door at the bookshop, Brian Spooner was whistling as he poked magazines and comics into the cardboard folders, filling advanced orders for regular customers. He was always whistling. He whistled in the garden. He whistled in the street. He whistled in his car and in his shop. Whether through happiness or habit, people never really knew. His first job on arriving at work had been to rescue the bundle of newspapers delivered by a truck from the Wellington overnight. They were dumped in the shop entrance just off the footpath. Early risers who wanted to catch up with the news before the shop opened could pull one from the stack and pay for it by poking coins through a slot on the door into a wooden box attached to the inside. It was an honesty system that worked up to a point. Some days the money collected would fall short of the cost of the papers taken, but other times it would exceed it. Tit for tat. Green grocer Jimmy R. Kitt and his mother were stacking shelves with fruit and vegetables in their little shop, sitting between Tui Morgan's garage and the cycle and mower repair shop run by Guy Rhodes. On the opposite side of Main Street, rival green grocer Daddy Ming and his wife were doing the same. Mrs. Ming was a hard working woman whose life was not made easy because of a major eyesight problem. One eye was closed and in order to see anything at all, she had to hold the eyelid of the other eye open with her finger. Rumours abundant in Greytown as to what had caused the woman such discomfort. Most believed, rightly or wrongly, that Mrs Ming had been subjected to torture by the Japanese who invaded China. They had severed muscles that controlled movement of her eyelids. On this day, as with any other day, she was helping Daddy keeping the shelves stacked as best she could and serving customers. Daddy Ming was a stereotypical Chinese elder. He had a dozen long wispy whiskers dangling from his lower chin. The two spoke in English to customers, but otherwise spoke to each other while in the shop in their native tongue. Somewhere along the line, Daddy had taken a ticket in a rather unique raffle, the prize being a wooden model of a Māori pa. He won it, and proudly put it on display in his shop where it remained for years. About the time Fred Harris arrived back home and closed the front door behind him, elsewhere in town, Joan Judd opened her door and stepped out onto the front lawn. She was heading for the library. In the warm autumn sunshine, petite Mrs Judd was feeling pretty positive about the day. She wore a blouse with an open cardigan, a fashionable skirt and a sensible, but by no means fuddy-duddy, shoes. Her neat appearance was complemented by a ready smile, befitting the town's librarian who had deservedly earned a reputation as being very good at her job, helpful, friendly, but firm. She encouraged children to join the library, and when they did, offered advice as to what she thought they may enjoy reading. But she brooked no noise or nonsense. The library was a place of learning and quiet contemplation, and this Friday would be no different. Joan was from a well-respected, well-heeled pioneering Greytown family. Surprisingly, she had never married. To her confidence, Joan confessed that her younger days she had felt uneasy around men, apart from being those in her family. 
She attributed that to having been educated in all girl secondary school, and not being one to push herself forward, she had missed the bus when it came to men in marriage. Joan took her time walking into town. She was early and would have plenty of time to arrange things before the library opened to the public. Reaching the downstairs door of the Borough Council building, she paused briefly to wave at Mick Horton across the street. Mick was returning to his butchery from the banking, the takings, do that again. Mick was returning to his butchery from the banking, the takings the previous day before. No, that's not right either. Mick was returning to his butchery from banking the takings from the day before. Technically, he was Joe's, Joan's boss, being mayor, although the country library service could equally lay claim to her. Mick waved back and cooed out, have a good day, as Joan entered the building and made her way up the wide winding staircase that took her to the library on the upper floor. Awaiting her was a stack of returned books, which she retrieved just before closing on Thursday and put aside for the morning. Each would need checking off and returning to the appropriate shelf. In the corner of the library sat a small table, on it a couple of crumpled newspapers and two pairs of horned rimmed glasses for those who needed help with the print. Joan had brought a sandwich with her for lunch and the zip meant that she could make herself a cuppa when she wanted. All that remained to be known all that remained to be known was who would be first through the door when the library opened in the early afternoon. Odds were it would be one of the mothers, as most of the men were at work and the children were at school. Joan would know the woman, or woman, who arrived first, and would spend a few minutes quietly chatting with them before they wandered off into the corridors of books. Soon the library would be relocated to a shop just across the road next to Mick's butchery, briefly used by Trevor Gray, selling ice creams and sweets. Joan was happy at the thought of moving, as it would mean not having to climb up and down the stairs every day. Being down at street level, she wouldn't feel so isolated as to what was happening in town, especially in the mornings before the library opened. A compelling reason for the relocation was that older people and those who were disabled had the devil's own job getting up the stairs to the library. As Joan busied herself ticking off the returns, Bill Brown's bakery staff were taking time out for morning tea. Not at all. Not all at once, mind. The woman serving in the shop had to take their morning teas in turns, making sure the counter was always manned. Out the back, the bakers had been at it for hours long before the sun was up. Bill was fairly confident. The small mountain of beautifully brown-topped barracudas and square sandwich loaves would be enough to get through the day, which, like all Fridays, would be the busiest day of the week. He knew enough bread had been baked to satisfy customers who had a standing order, but it was casual buyers off the street who could throw a spanner in the works. That was certainly the case when it came to selling his cakes and biscuits. Bill remembered one particular Friday when a customer had arrived in the shop in the afternoon wanting half a ton of cakes. It had been an exaggeration, of course, but the customer had nevertheless cleaned him out entirely of cakes, telling Bill they were for a weekend family gathering. That day, Bill had been left with nothing to tempt the others coming into his shop later in the day. Surely the family could have placed an order a few days in advance, but no such luck. Having cast his eye over the racks of bread, Bill turned his attention to summing up the daily bake of pies. Bill Brown's pies were famous in Greytown and beyond. He had been told so many times. They were altogether different pie from others on sale. Rather, sorry, round rather than the usual oval shaped pies on offer anywhere. Bill crammed them with delicious meat blend that had caused the filling to bulge over the top of the tasty pie crust. They were, along with his meringues and cream buns, the pride of the Bill Brown stable. In a couple of hours, lunch monitors from Greytown School would take a shortcut through Denny's, Denny's yard to Main Street. Two children, one on each side of a wooden box with rope handles to collect pies ordered earlier for the Friday school lunches. Bill knew he wasn't alone in working to fill school lunch orders. A few doors to the south, Bill McGregor was filleting fish while a vat of fat 
bubbled away, ready to cook thick chips from a mountain of potatoes he had finished slicing up. Few customers came into the shop for fish and chips in the early morning, so he could go set about work uninterrupted. But by lunch, but by lunchtime, I'm going to do that whole thing again. Few customers came into the shop for fish and chips early in the morning, so he could set about his work uninterrupted. But by lunchtime, business picked up and stayed that way for the remainder of the afternoon. He too had a list of school lunch orders. The contents didn't vary, as the standard order for all pupils treating themselves to bottle. <sighs> Try it again. The contents didn't vary as the standard order for all pupils treating themselves to a bought lunch was one piece of fish and sixpence worth of chips. As he wielded his filleting knife, Bill mulled over a conversation he had had the night before, over a beer in the workingmen's club. Of mixed race, Bill was being ribbed about his Māori blood. OK, it was all in fun, but no one ever ribbed him about his Scottish lineage. Well, Bill, you don't talk like a Scotsman, that's why. Of course, he didn't. Bill was a born and bred New Zealander. Maybe not, but I'm just as proud of the Scottish side. Bill sometimes acknowledged that Scottish side by wearing a type of Bill sometimes acknowledged that Scottish side by wearing a type of beret or tam o shanter, which had a strip of tartan woven into it. The filleting done, Bill turned his attention to the dining room on the south side of his fish and chip shop, blocked off from the view of the takeaway customers at the counter. It didn't take long to get the table set up. There were only three or four of them. A simple tablecloth over each one, knives and forks, salt and pepper shakers, black sauce and vinegar and small glass jug. That, it was all that was needed. In fact, all that was expected. When all said and done, the menu was as predictable as the table setting. You could treat yourself to fish and chips with an egg or two on top, sausages, chips and eggs. Both meals came with sliced bread and knobs of rolled butter. No one complained, well not as a general rule. It was a good fare, as good as you could hope for in town. That's a longish chapter. Right, I'm going to give my voice a little bit of a break now. I'm going to play a piece of music. It's not a very long piece of music. So like I said, these are long and I have a meeting once I finish here. Uh, this is sort of memory related. It's from a TV series I really, really like called Death in Paradise. This particular piece of music pertains to one of the characters who's learning a bit more about the history of one of his friends that he knows. This is Vincent's song. Who's the 
a stunning piece of music that one I won't tell you anything about it as to not give you any spoilers if you haven't watched Death in Paradise definitely check it out especially the first couple of series they were the best ones all right we'll continue on with this one I'll give you one more chapter and then I need to be on my way chapter three Butcher Fred gets the message the inhabitants of 18 Jellicoe Street had stretched and yawned their way into the early oh start that again the inhabitants of 18 Jellicoe Street had stretched and yawned their way into life hours earlier first up was the boy who had tumbled out of his single wire wove bed as the first rays of sunlight sent the darkness packing he didn't like staying in bed preferring to throw his clothes on and creep out the back door and sit on a pile of slab wood his father had brought in and would one day be put to the saw bench there he sat thinking idle thoughts contemplating the mysteries of the universe and savoring the solitude it was a school day but that was still hours away the boy had got over his long-lasting rebellion against school life he no longer needed to be goaded and threatened by his older sister Elaine as he bounced along the road to school on his bum. Elaine was four years older and had been charged with getting her rebellious brother off to school grounds, even if that meant taking him by the scruff of the neck and dragging him. If she succeeded, then she had to keep a watch on him until the bell to enter class rang, torpedoing his plans of escape in a sprint back home. By now he had realised his protests were in vain. The war was over. He had surrendered to the education department. Sitting on the wood, the boy could feel the neighbourhood slowly stirring. He caught the sound of a truck rumbling along the street, and although he could not see through the dense laurel hedges surrounding the house block, he knew by the distinctive sound of the motor it was Brian Skeet taking his milk to the dairy factory. Brian and his brother Pat farmed let's make sure I've printed this right. Brian and his brother Pat farmed Putakal in partnership on land near the end of the road with their cousin France it is with their cousin France farming next door. In the distance a rooster crowed from the big old oak tree in the far corner. Oh, there's a comma in there. This is gonna be a long day, isn't it? In the distance a rooster crowed and from the big old oak tree in the far corner of the section rose a flock of small birds probably spooked by the sound of the truck rumbling towards them next up in the farmer household was sheila his mum he could hear her moving about in the kitchen which doubled as a dining room pulling out the damper on the old black cast iron shack lock coal range reigniting the embers from last night's burn Mum would then set the table for breakfast and cut the best part of a loaf of bread for toast. She knew where the boy would be, and she could call him and and she could call him in first once the breakfast was ready. This is awful. Let's try this again. She knew where the boy would be, and she would call him in first once the breakfast was near ready, then whistled up the other children and her husband Ron. The boy knew what breakfast for him would be. Two poached eggs on toast, with a hot drink and extra toast. In fact, he more or less demanded it. Breakfast was not breakfast without eggs, but occasionally he had to bend to the will of mum and accept porridge or, heaven forbid, a bowl of cornflakes. The staggered start to breakfast suited his mum, who could avoid having to cater for five children and a husband all at once. Later, she could sit in glorious silence and actually get to have her own breakfast. Having been fed, the boy had a chore to do, and he was tasked with feeding hot mash to the dozen or so chooks cooped up in the hen house Dad had built on the eastern boundary. That done, he washed and got dressed for school, heartened by the knowledge tomorrow would be Saturday. He said goodbye to Mum and to Dad, and with some envy gave toddler Evan a pat on the head. Dad always wanted for the children to leave for school before heading off to work in his gooseberry, raspberry and currant plots. The boy would remain imprisoned in class until morning break and then again until the lunch bell rang. He would run home, gulp down lunch 
all the time being told by mum to slow down and scoot back to play bull rush, or running through, as it was also called, or kingpin or marbles. To follow would be another two hours in class. By the time the bell rang at 3pm to the end of the school day, the business of Greytown was well and truly underway. Friday was late night shopping. Farmers had abandoned their gumboots and brushed on... Oh, no they didn't. Farmers had abandoned their gumboots and brushed cotton shirts with button missing and a hole in the elbow and come to town for the traditional Friday shop. They had put on trousers carefully ironed with crease down the middle, a clean shirt, a pair of short all wool socks and well nuggeted black shoes. Some even wore a tie and a felt hat which they tipped as they passed ladies in the street. Those who liked a beer or two would eventually gravitate to one of the three pubs, the top pub, middle pub, or bottom pub, or, if they were members, the working men's club. Inside the pubs, they joined a coterie, coterie? They joined a coterie of self-employed, a couple of out-of-towners and the usual permanent fixtures at the bar. Time to put away a couple of beers before workers knocked off and spilled into the pubs to add weight to the six o'clock swill. Back at school, the last bells singled the start of a stampede. Kids who took the bus to school, either from Battersea, Papawai, Matarawa, had to line up and wait to board the buses. But the boy and townies like him wasted no time getting clear of the schoolyard. Running along the stock road, not its proper title, but one everyone used because the last of the old drovers still drove cattle along it to save going through town. The boy turned right onto a lane high in Coxfoot, a paper road known as Mahupuku Street. Reaching the fence of the back paddock leading to the home, he pushed down the middle wire and slithered through. He ran through the paddock and through a gap in the hedge and onto the back lawn. The back door of the house was open. The boy burst into the kitchen to find mum had company. Melba Mayrick was sitting at the kitchen table with his mother, teacups and saucers and a plate of small cakes from Brown's Bakery in front of them, along with homemade Anzac biscuits and block cake. Slow down, don't run, and say hello to Mrs Mayrick, said mum. Hello Mrs Mayrick. The boy was given a couple of biscuits and told to get himself a drink. That meant searching the cupboard in the scullery, where on the second shelf up was a large glass jug of orange cordial made up from concentrate with a doily draped over the top. In the smaller cupboard below was a bottle of lemon and barley water, lemon and barley water cordial and a ship's lime juice. Spoiled for choice he was. Now don't run off. I have a job for you, Mum said. I want you to bike to the butchers and get me two pound of rump steak. Turning to Mrs Mayrick, she said, Last week I bought some steak, and when I got it home, Melba, it was all gristle and fat. The boy took the money, got on one of the old black bikes slung against the wall of the shed, and set off for Svensson's butchery. Arriving at the shop, he leaned the bike against the veranda post and pushed through the door into the shop. Shop owner, widow Mary Svensson, was tucked away in the tiny office to the left of the shop counter, wearing her woolen coat and one bar heater on the floor to the side of her. She was not she was not only the ship's owner, but also the cashier and did the books. The butcher, Fred McCarty, was hard at work breaking down a side of beef on the huge wooden butcher's block. Putting down the knife, he greeted the boy in his usual fashion. G'day, Duke. What can I do for you? He knew that, amo he knew that amused the boy, as the family's wayward German shepherd was named Duke, and a bit of a humour didn't go astray, especially as the farmer family had been loyal customers of Svensson's butchery for years. This time, he got more than he bargained for. I want two pound of rump steak and not all gristle and fat like last week. With the wind knocked out of his sails, Fred took a moment or two to gather his wits. Having sliced off the steak, he turned to face the boy, his face solemn, but with just a hint of a smile on his lips. Okay, Duke, here we are, 
top quality rump steak, no gristle or fat. Now when you get home, I want you to put in an order with your dad. Tell him I want two pound of gooseberries, but I don't want any skin or pips. Thinking the butcher, thinking the butcher must have flipped his lid, the boy puzzled over that reply as he pedaled his way home. In the kitchen, Mum and Mrs. Mayrick were just draining the teapot. Don't worry, Mum, this steak won't be like last week's. I told Fred we didn't want any gristle or fat. Mum's jaw dropped, her face drained into a lighter shade of pale, but before she found words, the boy finished his piece. He said to tell Dad he wants two pound of gooseberries, but he doesn't want any skin or pips. The two women glanced at each other, then burst out laughing. Adults, especially mothers, are a strange breed, thought the boy. Just before 5pm, Elaine was sent on her way to the fish and chip shop. Fish and chips were not often on the farmer household menu, as most meals were home cooked, but every now and again, always on a Friday, an exception was made. Elaine biked off on her pink girl's bike and soon returned with a single parcel wrapped in recycled newspaper. Mum was hovering about, bringing out bottles of tomato and Worcester sauce, white bread and butter. Elaine's siblings and Dad were already at the table. Dad sat at the head. Pamela, Gary and Mum each had a chair and the younger two boys were seated on the long wooden stool at the back, saving a place at one end for Elaine. Opening the steaming parcel, Mum dished out a piece of fish and a dollop of chips on each plate. She knew this would be followed by a barrage of complaints, and she was right. She's got more than me, and his fish is bigger than mine, were the standard grizzles that fell on deaf ears. Then as plates emptied, the game of having the last say started. Chips were sneaked off plates and hidden, some under the rim of plates. No, we'll do that again. Chips were sneaked off plates and hidden, some under the rim of a plate, others pushed into a pocket. When it looked certain that everyone else had finished eating, these were brought out of hiding with great ceremony and with exaggerated pleasure, slowly lowered into the mouth of the lucky last. The meal over, it was time to disappear before being collared to help with the clearing up the table and washing up. By now, time, gentlemen, please, had been called in the bars throughout town, and the drinkers who had pushed down as many beers as they could manage to beat the clock were spilling out onto the street. From the vantage point just outside the front gate, the children could see the aftermath of the overindulgence. Around Jellicoe Street corner came the most frequent of these overindulgers, a man far too fond of the bottle who had great difficulty getting his two feet to work in unison. While he was a figure of fun to the kids who watched his valiant efforts to stay on the road and off the Coxford verges or even upright, it was not something Dad relished seeing. Many times he had helped pick up the man and despite being abused, reset his compass, pointing him in the right direction to his home. This night was not to be one of them. Lurching past the children who had retreated to inside the gate as he passed, the drunk careened towards a huge clump of blackberries that ran alongside the frontage of Rayson's paddock. For a few seconds he tottered, then plunged forward headlong into the cruel mass of thorny blackberries and lay there. Taking fright, the kids ran inside, not daring to tell their parents, who were washing and drying dishes, as, technically, they should not have been watching, but wondered whether he would survive. He did, and lived to stagger home on many other nights, although he was never again seen to take the plunge into the blackberries. In town, late night shoppers, whoop, in town, late night shopping was in full swing. As dusk pushed the light of day away, housewives were making sure they had what was needed for the weekend, as shop doors stay closed for the two-day break and dairies were forbidden from selling grocery items until Monday. Teenage boys, their hair slicked back with brill cream, were starting to gather outside the two milk bars in the town centre, hoping to attract an eye or one of the other girls 
No, that doesn't sound right. Hoping to attract the eye of one or other of the girls also gathered nearby, they practiced their bravado on each other. In the Bluebird Dairy, Phyllis and Colin Floors were busy serving a gaggle of giggling girls who liked to hang out there and play the jukebox. Milkshakes of many different flavours were whisked up and poured into large metal containers with a dollop of tip-top ice cream included. The Floors family had been in the business for years, but before long they would sell to new owners Stuart and Daphne Guilford. In the direct line across the street was the Bluebird's opposition milk bar, the open door milk bar and tea rooms. There Harold Garmon Sway yep, yep. There Harold Garmon Sway and his wife Hilda sold a rival brand ice cream, Peter Pan, and picked up business serving light meals. The Garmin Sways were the first in town to start selling orange and raspberry flavoured TT2 ice blocks, a smash hit with every boy and girl in town. So perfectly placed were the two competing businesses, their owners could stand in their doorways and eyeball each other while monitoring their comings and goings across the road. The boy was too young to yet be let out on Friday night unless his mother had made a late dash to the shops and took him along but his older brothers and sisters were not. Gary had just qualified as a teenager and all that went along with it, including taking up the gentle art of smoking. As he left home to go to the flicks, which screened in the town hall doubling as a picture theatre, Gary snuck into the toilet. This was a fairly large room for what was supposed to be the smallest room in the house and, while attached to the main house, could only be accessed from the outside. There he pulled towards him a half bag of Portland cement his father had stored against a wall. The cement had been there for months, if not years, its contents well and truly hardened, and now of no probable use. Hidden behind the still hefty bag was a packet of Gray's tins, the cheapest filter cigarettes you could buy. Gary pushed them into his jacket pocket. He wouldn't light up until he was well clear of home. Little did Gary know the boy was well aware of his hiding place. He had stumbled across it while contemplating his navel there, but hadn't led on to anybody. From time to time he carefully checked the packet to see how many smokes had been used, but he never had the courage to take one, just in case his older brother was good at maths. Very likely his two sisters also knew of the existence of the cigarettes, but like many in a big family of the day, there was a code of silence. Dad had been a smoker but had gone cold turkey after visiting the doctor to be told new evidence had revealed smoking was a potential killer. The death of King George VI from lung cancer had brought home the deadly link. Dad, on hearing smoking had been blamed for killing the king, literally tossed his half-full packet of Park Drive tobacco out the doctor's open window, never to smoke again. Pamela and Elaine were both age qualified to take in the Friday night film, the latter only just, and put on their best dresses, cardigans and shoes to head into Main Street. So the boy and younger brother Evan, nope, so the boy and younger brother Evan were the stay-at-homes, but that didn't bother them one bit. The old valve radio was plugged in, there was sure to be a comedy of some sort playing. Dad sprawled out on the settee, Mum at the kitchen table knitting. The boy had his pride and joy to play with, his collection of teepees, totem poles, and colourfully painted Indian braves full of finery and their scores. These were spread out on the mat in front of the coal range, where Indian villages were built and battles fought. Beside him, Evan was mucking around with his toys, a favourite being the dark blue police car. As bedtime approached, Mum made supper for them, a piece of block cake, a couple of biscuits and an apple, peeled with the core neatly extracted, and there the day ended. Well, that's it for today. Uh, there's no holiday on Monday, I believe, so we will see you on Monday. We've got another couple of chapters. We're doing four and five. We will eventually get through this brilliant, brilliant book. Have a great week, and like I said, we'll catch up with you in a week. Have a good one.